G'day everyone, welcome back and we're back inside the lost world of reptiles. Now we're going to be talking to you about some of our beautiful skink species. One that's from overseas but the rest of them are Australian natives. Now uh, I've got Sammy with me today. Uh, Sam's going to help me out. He's actually holding on to one of our beautiful, beautiful skinks and she's, he's actually trying to feed her at the moment some poke or awesome. I've always got up in the devil's ivy there. So uh, she just had one big piece of it, but I'm saying that she's kind of gotten over it really quickly. And after she had her first bit of pothos, she's kind of gone, no, nah, I don't want to do it for the camera. Uh, but we'll see if Sam can get her to have a little bit of food. Oh, have a little nibble. And this should be quite cute. Now, the animal that Sam's holding is really, really special. And those are only a hand. Oh, there we go. I'll just let you listen to the chump. What's cool, this is one of, the only, one of the few species that will happily eat pothos, which is quite cool. So you get to see it up nice and close. We'll try and give her another piece. Trying to get, oh, get the cameras in there. Aren't they a beautiful lizard? Very, very unique. And we'll get the last bit of pothos in and then we can talk a little bit more about this species. That's really cool. How does that sound? That get you excited? Awesome. Yeah, yeah, it is, does so get you excited, excited, doesn't it? Nothing gets you more excited than skinks. <laughs> okay, so this is the Solomon Island skink. Now, if you don't know where the Solomon Islands are, if you go about, I don't know, well over a thousand kilometres to our, if you're in Queensland and you went northeast um, and then directly east of Papua New Guinea, uh, is where you might, might find, or where you would find the Solomon Island archipelago. And that's where these skinks are endemic to. So they're not a species that you'll find here in Australia. Now, a couple of cool facts about them. I'm not going to keep her very long because she probably wants to get back to her big giant exhibit and get away from Sam. Uh, not because she doesn't like Sam, it's just that he smells. And um, so they grow to, actually to what is the largest skink species or extinct skink species on the planet, which is quite a substantial lizard considering some of our skink species here in Australia, like the land mullet, are quite large. But what's quite unique about them, in of their behaviour, they're almost completely arboreal, which means they live in big, tall trees. They've got a prehensile tail, so they're not only called the Solomon Island skink, but they're also called the prehensile-tailed skink, so they'll use that tail to hold on to branches. And another thing too, they live in small little family groups called circulars. So uh, you'll have a, a, a male and a female, and they will care for their young for an extended period of time. Now, in terms of their breeding ecology, Quite amazing as well. The, the female gestation period of juveniles with inside the female is about six to eight months. So it's a fairly long gestation period and the babies are actually born uh, quite large in comparison to other skink species. But we'll talk a, bit, a little bit more about skink breeding later. But you can see how adept they are at climbing. They do like to be up nice and high and they actually like to live in, well really, in the, in the top part of the canopy. Uh, they are a herbivorous species. So you saw one of the food items that they're eating before, but they are herbivorous and obviously they find their food uh, in the higher reaches of the canopy as well. Now there's only a handful of Solomon Island skinks here in Australia. I think, I think Reptile Park might even be the only place that has them and the only place that you can see them. And they are quite unique and we do have one on display at the Lost World of Reptiles. So when we do open up and you can visit, you'll be able to see a Solomon Island skink up fairly close. Now because she's trying to climb so much, I can tell she just wants to get back to a big beautiful exhibit. But before we do, see the way she's using her tail to actually grip onto Sam's hand. So really she's making herself feel comfortable by holding on nice and tight. Long sharp claws, perfect adapted for their life uh, up in the trees. Now, if you look at something like a pink tongue skink, which is another native skink to Australia, I should say, um, it's almost like they're a pink tongue skink, but on steroids. So they're really, really large in comparison uh, to our pink tongue skinks, but they have that similar long tail, almost similar body shape. Pink tongues typically have more of like a triangulated head in comparison to the wider head that you can see on the Solomon Island skink. She's a beautiful girl. Uh, and yeah, we're very lucky to be able to work with her. Thank you, Sam. You didn't no know worries. Her Thank you. Awesome Daniel. stuff, mate. Um, so yeah, so I just wanted to show you that skin first because it is so cool uh, and so unique and as I said, we're very lucky to work with them here at the Reptile Park. But now I'm going to jump across to Australian skinks. Now in terms of species of lizard here in Australia, the most speciose uh, for us would be our skinks. We have over around 450 species in total. Some are quite small, the little Manishas, which is a little genus of Australian squint, skip, squints. Skinks <laughs> only grow to, you know, 40 mill millimetres, so really, really small. What do I say? Squinks. Moving on, skinks. Manisha, very, very small. Our largest would be a land mullet or maybe uh, uh, an eastern blue tongue. Land mullets probably grow bigger, uh, but even blue tongues can grow to lengths of around 60 centimetres. So I thought I'd start off with probably one of the more most commonly seen, which would be the eastern blue tongue lizard. Now we've got a, got a whole 
Okay. While you're doing that, Dan, yep. we'll show everyone the desert night skinks in yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, there's some little night skinks, which are beautiful, beautiful little animals. Um, one of the females in there, I, I don't know if you can see her, she's actually, she's gravid, so uh, hopefully soon she'll have a couple of little babies, which is nice. So they've got a nice little, it's a nice little colony. Um, and the best thing about them is the way they behave with each other, quite communal, they even go to the toilet in the same spot. So really, really cool skinks. All right, now I think I've grabbed the right bag. I can't really remember. Um, so inside this bag is our first blue tongue. We're going to see a few blue tongues. I love my blueies. Yep, got a blue. Good, 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 good. Now, oh yes, perfect. So this is uh, one of our beautiful blue tongue skinks, or eastern blue tongue lizards. Now, there is a few different types of blue tongue lizard found around Australia, but the eastern blue tongue lizard is the one you might find if you're living in eastern or northern Australia. Now, I've got another couple of blue tongues that I'm going to show you today, but most people are quite familiar with the eastern blue tongue lizard. Now, obviously, it gets its name from the big fleshy blue tongue that's going to stick out every few seconds, or it should at any moment. Stick out that big fleshy blue tongue. It's chosen not to do it at the moment, but it will. And it, Caitlin's wiggling her finger, trying to make it look like it's a worm to get it excited, but the tongue hasn't come out. But they do get the name from the big fleshy blue tongue. And that tongue is very important to this lizard for a couple of different reasons. One, um, but the main one would be, their def it's a defense mechanism. And I'll tell you why. You see this short little lizard, he's got you know, little stumpy legs. He's not designed to move very quickly across the land. So how do you avoid predation from something like a faster moving fox, cat, or, or even maybe something like a kookaburra? Well, that's the, uh, what they do to avoid predation is they'll actually use their tongue. They'll use a couple of different methods. So they'll flatten themselves out to make themselves look nice and big. They'll open their mouth, they'll start to hiss really loudly. Then they'll expose their big fleshy blue tongue. And you could imagine to another animal, you see the colours blue, red, bright yellow, uh, you're going to think poison, danger or venom. So the blue tongue is relying on its bluff system, making itself look scary as a way to avoid predation. Now whilst that trick might work sometimes, something really cool that the majority of skink species do possess is the ability of self-autonomy. And what that means is they can actually drop off a portion of their tail. And you can actually see this lizard that I'm holding today has actually done that. Um, once upon a time, this particular blue tongue lizard would have dropped off the last portion of its tail there. Uh, you can see where it's pointed and a little bit discoloured, which would have saved its life. So blue tongues will do that. You could imagine a little blue tongue scurrying through the bush, Kookaburra is flying overhead, swoops down, grabs the lizard, lizard drops his tail, kookaburra is distracted by the movement of the wiggling tail, which allows the blue tongue to scurry off back into the bushes. Now, if you do happen to have a blue tongue lizard living in your backyard, you should rejoice. I could not think of a better animal to have living in your backyard. There's a couple of different reasons. One, if you're in Eastern Australia, if you're in the well, right through Eastern Australia, really, and there's a lot of funnel web species. Uh, blue tongues can eat funnel webs, even around the Sydney region. The world's, world's, one of the world's most toxic spiders is the Sydney funnel web. A blue tongue can eat them, no worries. But also, too, if you're into your gardens, this is the world's best natural snail bait. They absolutely love uh, to eat snails. So I really cannot think of a better native animal to have living in your gardens. They pose absolutely no threat to your pets at home. The only thing I would advise, if, if they do have a blue tongue in your backyard, make sure you keep your dogs and your cats away because they do pose far more greater threat to a blue tongue rather than the opposite way around. Another key area to look out for blue tongues when you're working in your backyard, maybe you're on the whippersnipper or on the lawnmower, see far too many blue tongues run over by lawnmowers and hit with whippersnippers, so always keep an eye out for the blue tongues. And if there's one more spot you can keep an eye out for them as well, it's crossing the road. When I was leaving work the other day, I was on the highway, I know everyone's going at 110, but a little blue tongue was squashed on the road, quite sad. Uh, that's the first blue tongue I've seen this season, and unfortunately it was killed by a car. So always keep an eye out for these blue tongues on the warmer days, moving about a little bit, and if you do happen to see one on, your, on the road, make sure you slow down for them. Now this is the time of year where blue tongues will be coming together, where males and females will start to mate and breed. Uh, after they've mated, you've got a fairly long gestation period where after that, a female blue tongue can give birth to over 20 young, which is quite amazing when they're born. They are very, very cute, but it's pretty incredible to think that the female blue tongue can give birth to so many babies. 
But the next animal I'm going to show you is a little bit different, more similar to the Solomon Island skink that we saw before. She's a big female, but typically in the breeding season, she'd only give birth to maybe two babies, and they're much larger when they're born in comparison to a baby blue tongue. And of course, I'm going to be talking about an animal with probably the most common, most common names of any animal on the planet. I'll grab it out now. How many skinks have you brought for us today, Dan? Uh, I think there's four in total. So the three big ones and the one and one little one that we'll finish off with. So let me just find this giant thing. There it goes. Now these guys don't live in the bags, do they? No, no, no. These bags are just for transport. And what the bags do is reptiles like small, dark, confined spaces. So it actually kind of calms them down. They feel quite comfortable. It's the same way we'll transport our snakes. Uh, once they go in the bag, they do relax quite a bit. They stop moving around. And then they can come out nice and like, look at this, this chunky thing. Um, she's big, she's beautiful. And as I said, this is the animal with probably the most common names on the planet. We, we're looking at a shingle back, a pine cone lizard, a two headed lizard, a bog eye, um, a bobtail skink if we're in Western Australia. So, yes, they do have lots of common names. And they have a fairly large distribution throughout, I guess, southwestern Australia. South Australia, Eastern Queens, sorry, Western Queensland and Western New South Wales is where you might encounter a beautiful shingleback just like I'm holding right now. They are probably one of the most fascinating looking animals uh, on the planet. And I guess they do quite resemble a pine cone to, pine cone to a degree. Uh, and obviously, if you've ever seen the shingles on the on roofing, it does look quite similar uh, to the back of this lizard, hence the name Shingleback. And the other name, two-headed lizard. And because she's sitting in that position right now, uh, she's displaying that perfectly for you. Their head does look very similar uh, to their tail, which can be a great way to deter predators if you're shaking that tail, confusing that predator. But they are a type of blue tongue, so when they do want to put on an impressive display, just like the eastern blue tongue we met before, they'll open their mouth really, really wide, They'll display that big fleshy blue tongue and hopefully that will be enough to ward off any would-be predators. Now again, they're not the fastest moving animals. So if that scare tactic doesn't work, the unfortunate thing for a shingleback is they won't have the same ability like the eastern blue tongue to drop that tail. Uh, so if the bluff system doesn't work, they're far more vulnerable. Now what's quite unique about the shinglebacks is the fact that they will form monogamous pairs. Monogamy is very rare in the reptile world. And what I mean by monogamous pairs is the same males and females will mate year after year. So when it starts to warm up in spring, the male and the females will come together and spend eight to 10 weeks together. They'll mate during that period. Then after about five month gestation period, the female will give birth to generally two young. And as I said, they actually are really, really large when they're born. About 30% of the size of the adult female. So you could imagine a baby's gonna come out and it's still gonna be that big. They are quite substantial babies. They are very, very cute. They grow up way too fast. Uh, and this is definitely another animal that I would recommend always keeping an eye out for crossing the roads, and I'll tell you why. Uh, there's been documented stories where, uh, say, a male or a female shingleback has been struck by a car, and its pair, so the other one, the other male or the other female, has sat by the dead shingleback. So always keep an eye out. I know it's quite sad, Caitlin's giving me the sad face, but it is sad. Not that I can see past the mask, I'm just guessing. Um, but. What I'm saying is, if they're struck by a car, the male or the female might sit next to the other one as well. So they are quite unique. They're definitely one of my favourite types of lizard. Similar to the uh, Solomon Island skink, they're primarily herbivorous, uh, and that makes up the majority of their diet. And they're great little animals to see moving around. All right, we'll stick this one back, and then we'll get out our little kind of uh, skink to finish off with. So Australia really is like a home to a whole range of skinks, as I said, 450 species in total. Uh, they pretty much fill all different habitat niches right across the country. And this next little lizard that I'm going to show you now is restricted to Western Australia. Uh, they're a beautiful little animal. They're called a little sort of pygmy spiny-tailed skink. I've actually got a few right behind me. So there's a couple on display. The, the, the thing with this one that I'm holding, it actually comes from a different family group as that one. So interestingly from that, if I went and put this one inside of there, that exhibit, the ones inhabiting that exhibit are probably going to be extremely aggressive towards the one that I'm holding right now. In fact, um, so aggressive they bite the arms, they'll bite the back. I, I, you know, I've literally seen them almost take each other's arms off before. So um, the animals inside that exhibit 
would, I would not put this one inside with them. I have, he lives with his own colony. Um, this is a male, there's a female that he lives with and they've got their young. So he would go straight back to there. I would never put him into that exhibit. Now what's cool about this genus of lizard is they're called spiny-tailed skinks. And you can, can is that lighting okay? That's right. It's good. So you can see the spines on the base of the tail there. Now what these spines do is that it actually enables them to wedge themselves in. So say they're under a, on a tree branch and underneath the bark or maybe they're in a crevice like a Cunningham skink would do when it's hanging inside the sandstone, particularly in winter. They wedge themselves in, they almost kind of puff out a little bit and it makes them very hard to dislodge. So if you could imagine even the most, you know, most intelligent of predatory species trying to work that hard to dislodge an animal like this from a crevice, it's going to deter them very, very quickly. So you'll see Cunningham skinks, I'm just using an example because it's one local and native to where we live. They'll wedge themselves in and you almost can't remove them. So it's a great defence mechanism, not only the ability to find a hole to see be safe in, but also the fact that they can wedge themselves in nice and tight, which is going to deter an animal from trying to eat them. They're beautiful, beautiful lizards. Agonias are one of my favourite different types of skink. Uh, and here at the park, we do have a couple of species. So like the depressor, like we're looking at right now, or the Cunningham skinks that exhibit in, uh, that are on display out in some of our reptile pits. Now, people get confused a little bit about, you know, what, why do we call it eastern blue tongue lizard or why do we call it an eastern blue tongue skink? So if you think of our lizard family groups here in Australia, you might have a skin like this, you might have an agamid like this, that's a dragon lizard, you might have a gecko or a pygopod, which is your legless lizards, but also too, you might have, you'll have your monitors as well. So they're broken up into these different family groups, okay? So this is a skink, that was a dragon that we met before. Uh, skinks 450, dragon lizards over 80, monitors around 30. So it's all broken up into these different family groups. And we're very lucky to have such a diverse range of reptiles here inhabiting our beautiful country of ours. Probably one of the more common ones that you would see uh, in your backyard, maybe like our little garden skink, a little brown skink. So we've all seen skinks before, there's no doubt about it. All right, Caitlin, I think that's uh, enough about our skinks today. I hope you've all been excited by our skinks. They are amazing. I'm sorry for at the start of the talk for calling them squinks. I'll never live that down in the reptile world, that's for sure. That'll haunt me forever, just like plenty of other things I've done at the reptile park. So do skinks make good pets, Dan? Look, to be honest, I started here, I first got my first blue tongue when I was a little fellow, about five years old, um, and they, they do make wonderful pets, as long as you look after them the correct way, make sure you give them plenty of love, that's the most important thing in terms of, when I say give them plenty of love, just making sure that you understand that a lot more goes into it than, say, maybe keeping a hermit crab. You need to understand a lot about their, their I guess, their biology and how they live in the wild and try and replicate that in a captive sense. So uh, make sure if you're ever going to consider a reptile as a pet that you do your research, you know, every single thing about the animal, not just in captivity, but in the wild as well, so that you can provide the best possible care. And that's everything different from thermal requirements to diet and the rest. How long do they generally live for? Yeah, so some skink species can live for a fairly long amount of time. Like I've seen um, a blue tongue is well over 30. So another thing to consider if you're going to buy a pet like a blue tongue, they're probably going to be in the family for a very, very long time. So yeah, well over 30. How many species of skinks are at the reptile park? Um, oh, I should have looked this up. Uh, that's such a good question. Thanks for whoever asked that. I can't think of it on top of my head. But I've got better facts, you know, there's probably over 1,500 species of skink found right, right around the world. They are quite cos cosmopolitan, so they're found everywhere except a Antarctica, uh, every continent except Antarctica, which is quite cool. In Australia, we have 450. Um, our largest genus of skink is... Oh, my squink. I can't get it out of my head now. Our largest genus of skink uh, 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 is Tenotus, which is really cool. So, um, yeah, we're very lucky to have lots of skinks here at the Reptile Park. We've probably got 30 or 40 or so. Are their spines very sharp on these ones? No, not really. Like, they are to a degree. It's not as not like touching the back of an echidna, um, but more so. It's, it's probably harder than, the, you know, because they are quite firm, particularly on the tail, but they certainly don't hurt if I press against them too hard. But remember, this, they're not so much to make me go like this. It's more so to lock themselves in so I can't pull them out. Not that I would. Do any other Australian skinks have interesting um, defensive tactics? Yeah, like I guess like a lot of the, some of the more common defensive displays, so like a, a, a centralian blue tongue, which we do have at the reptile park, they have a really impressive display with their tongue, where they'll flick their tongue quite vigorously. Uh, pink tongue skins will do something very similar, even though they don't have 
that big blue tongue, they obviously have a long pink tongue, but they will display that to a degree. But yeah, a lot of our skinks, some of them will wiggle their tails, uh, which is really cool. Some of the smaller skinks, when they're threatened, they'll start to wiggle their tail. And the reason for that, you can imagine, right? Say you're a snake and you're walk going towards, I sound like Brando then, say you're a snake and you're heading towards a lizard and it's wiggling its tail. If you're the snake, you're gonna react to that movement. So there's a very good chance that you will strike at the tail, not the body of the lizard, which allows the lizard then to either drop its tail or scurry away quite quickly. So yeah, a couple of our lizards do have fairly yeah, unique defensive mechanisms. Are there any species of skink that are vulnerable or under threat? Oh, there's heaps. Things like the Guthix skink would be a great example. Unfortunately, a lot of our smaller, let's just say smaller brown skinks that don't generate as much admiration as something like a koala would. And you can say the same for small brown birds, small brown frogs and the rest. So there's a lot of skinks in danger. And the main reason is, of course, habitat loss and habitat fragmentation. Also, too, introduced feral species. So things like cats and foxes. So a skink is an easy meal very, very easy meal for a cat or a fox. There's some great pictures online from a few years ago of a cat that was dissected and killed, uh, was killed and dissected and it had literally like 50 skinks inside of it. And that was probably just one night in a killing spree. That's why it's always a good reminder to keep your cats inside, just like Caitlin always does. All right, Dad, last question. What is your favorite skink species? My ever since I was little, I love blueies. You can't beat a blue tongue lizard. Um, I really like Centralian blue tongues because they're just the most beautiful animal. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to stick with an easy one, blueies, they're great. Uh, you can't go past the bluey. All right, guys, well, I hope you enjoyed today's live stream. Something a little bit different. We talked about skinks, so I got it right that time. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you're enjoying these videos. Uh, we're going to say goodbye to our skinky friends and to get back to work and have a lovely afternoon. See you at the Reptile Park soon, guys, when we open. Cannot wait. Hooroo. See you later.